Welcome to Friends of George MacDonald, an ongoing podcast designed to introduce and discuss the author and his influence on the hosts and listeners in popular culture alike. Welcome to another episode of Making Friends with George MacDonald. Today our guest is Jess Lederman. Uh, he's an author, a George McDonald enthusiast, and the founder of the Works of McDonald website. Welcome, Jeff. Good morning, you guys, and good afternoon for you um, on the East Coast there. Thank yeah, you. We're opposite coast. So it's great to have you on. We've talked uh, for ages online, um, so kind of nice to do a face-to-face. -face. Um, I was hoping you would share with people some about your journey um, coming to George and how all that came about. Yeah, sure. So let's see, we go back about 17 years or so uh, to um, 2000, 2006. My, uh, my late first wife, uh, uh, Terry, uh, and I were, were living in the Dallas area, and um, both of us were, were uh, atheists. I had been raised in a secular home and, and uh, was just... Uh, uh, or sort of a self-satisfied look down on um, people who believed, uh, thought they were fools. But Terry was a little bit different. She had had uh, a beautiful faith as a child, uh, but lost her faith when uh, she went to a college that was uh, run by uh, the Herbert Armstrong Worldwide Church of God. It was back in the it was real big back in the '50s, '60s. Uh, uh, but he uh, he went bad, and it was so uh, his hypocrisy was so obvious that it led her to a loss of faith. But one day uh, in 2006, she was uh, driving along and listening to uh, NPR, and they had an interview with Francis Collins. Now, Francis Collins is a guy who. People today might say, oh, wait, was, wasn't he Fauci's uh, boss? And that's true. Uh, but uh, the time he, publ he published a book in 2006, The Language of God, and it talked about he had been head of the government team working the Human Genome Project. So they were in a race with the private sector to map the human genome. Uh, and the, the two teams ended up uh, ultimately collaborating. But this book, The Language of God, is both about this very exciting race to map the human genome, one of the great accomplishments in human history, um, but also about his personal journey from atheism to faith. He uh, and the great influence on him was uh, was C.S. Lewis, another guy who went from atheism to uh, uh, to faith in, in Christ. And Collins, um, uh, who became a, a, a devout uh, evangelical uh, Christian. Um, but also, you know, one of the one of the greatest scientists in in uh, in the world. Uh, he's a very humble guy, and so he, rather than than uh, try to reinvent the wheel, he did a lot of quoting from C.S. Lewis. Anyway, my my wife was very uh, uh, taken by this interview, and she said, "You know, let's read this book, Language of God." Okay, why not? So we read it, and very impressive. Uh, but also, all these these. Uh, uh, quotes from from this guy C.S. Lewis. Well, they, they they were very they were they were very impressive. And so we said, you know, let's let's read more of of this guy Lewis. And so we bought a whole bunch of Lewis books. And you can, you can't go very far reading Lewis, as I'm sure is a constant drumbeat you know theme in all of your interviews that you do, without running into the guy he referred to as his master, uh, George MacDonald. And we said, oh, well, boy, if, if C.S. Lewis was so influenced by George MacDonald, maybe we should read MacDonald too. And this was back when uh, Johannesson um, uh, Publishing uh, still had available the complete set, you know, 50 some odd uh, hardcover volumes. We said, okay, well, in for a penny, in for a pound. We bought all 50 uh, volumes and started reading. And uh, so, uh, as it happened, not that many years, uh, just a few a few years later, uh, Terry was diagnosed with uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and basically a two-year death sentence. So we decided 
to uh, move from Dallas to the uh, middle of nowhere in, uh, in Alaska where we could sort of look out the window at, at, at God's uh, creation. And that allowed us the sort of the t time and, and the right atmosphere to finish reading through Lewis and McDonald. And really, these guys double teamed me in uh, you know going from atheism to to belief and it and it's interesting though the differences in in uh, in, in the way they did that because in in his in his great book mere christianity uh, lewis he sets forth a, a compelling case for for belief in god and george mcdonald in all of his writing he presented a god that i could i could love and in one of his novels, uh, Paul Young, who's, who's most famous for The Shack, although the quote I'm going to give you comes from his book, Eve, uh, he wrote that knowing the character of God is essential. And, and, you know, that is just so true because I could never believe, you know, my, my, um, my atheism was rooted in, uh, in having been exposed to, to a very different kind of, of, of God than I learned about in McDonald's. Uh, I could never believe in a God who condemns souls, perhaps even most souls, to eternal torment, let alone a Calvinist God who who creates beings, knits them in their mother's womb, right? Uh, preordained to to that sort of a fate. And and here's the beautiful thing is that neither could George MacDonald, right? Uh, he would readily agree with the with the new atheists, just as he agreed with Herbert Spencer in his own time, uh, that such a God is a monster and uh you know that's why mcdonald wrote uh, uh good souls many will one day be horrified at the things they now believe of god i think that's true of a lot of what you hear in uh in reformed churches uh, in particular uh, central to to mcdonald's theology her, is hermeneutics his whole approach to understanding scripture is the father heart of god right it's evident in in, in Jesus's parables or or the way that, that Jesus teaches us to speak to God right in the in the Lord's prayer our father so so McDonald did not believe that anyone would be condemned to to an, an, an eternity in, in hell uh, and he did believe that 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 all of us would ultimately find our way to uh, into the the father heart of God but but if so, this is often referred to as as universalism, right? Or universal salvation, universal reconciliation. McDonald is referred to as a universalist, although he never called himself that. But but what appealed to me, and I think to many, is is his universalism. It's practical and tough-minded, and it's tied to his his very tied to his understanding of the of the meaning of salvation. What are we saved from? which I think is, uh, is similar to the Eastern Orthodox uh, concept of theosis, union with God. You know, you often hear um, that you, you have to understand the bad news before you can appreciate the good news, right? We hear that all the time. And, and Reformed Christianity says the bad news is we all deserve to roast in hell. And the good news is uh, we're saved from that torment if we believe. You take the altar call, you say the sinner's prayer, whatever. McDonald says, the bad news is we're sinners. It's sin itself, not some punishment for sin, which is a horror. And the good news is our, our loving father wants to free us from the tyranny of sin. And so if punishment even torment is required to do so, as might be the case for the three of us or many of many out, uh, out there. Then, by all means, bring it on. Was was um, you know that appears often in McDonald's thinking, and so you get you know some of his famous quotes um, are, are worth are, are bringing up. Like uh, you know, he says, "The very fire of hell is the fire of love." but it is a love that will burn the evil out of you. So it's not that there's no hell. It's that it's, 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 it's not a, uh, a place of, of uh, eternal uh, punishment. It's a place to, of restoration. And, uh, and of course, his, his famous quote, there is no refuge from the love of God, that God will, will not spare anything to, um, to cure us of sin, essentially.
so given uh, that understanding of salvation, it's no wonder that he loathed the doctrine of imputed righteousness. You know, the idea that we're loathsome to, to, to God, but if he looks at us with, uh, he puts on his Jesus classes and looks at us and sees Jesus and Jesus's righteousness, then, okay, we get a, we get a pass and we get to come into heaven. And, and McDonald would say, no, I, I'm, there's no way until, until, until every bit of sin is burned off and whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And, 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 and probably, and we can all know from our own experiences in life, this is very in, intuitive, right? Oftentimes it's the pain you go through that, that helps, the, that helps us to um, uh, get on the right track. Uh, you know, until we are uh, as perfect as our father in heaven, as Jesus said, be perfect as your, as your father, your heavenly father. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sully heaven with my presence until I'm perfect. Um, it's also a strange, strange thought that uh, God could fool himself and not see us uh, and simultaneously <laughs> love us. Yeah. Right. Because when he, he sees our sin, it's not a, oh, how disgusting you really, you deserve to, you, do, you deserve to writhe in, in, in agony. It's, ah, oh, my, uh, for, for you that you're, you're, uh, you're, you're covered in sin. I want to help you become clean. All right. But this, this, uh, this whole, um, issue of, uh, where do we all end up? That actually is the, the one significant, uh, distinction uh, between McDonald uh, between you know, Lewis and his master McDonald um, it's the their their point of, of disagreement uh, both of them uh, agreed that hey there's no way that that God would ever condemn anyone to eternal torment right there's but Lewis uh, you know his his famous uh, quote is uh, the gates of hell are locked from the inside so he says that 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 People can will reject uh, God, and then in this life, and then post mortem, they might go on. Some of them might change their mind, uh, but some might go on rejecting God post mortem, and and then uh, that rejection has terrible consequences because eventually they lose their humanity entirely. There's nothing left to save. McDonald had a, a very different thought. The, the imagery that the that the two use. Uh, however, uh, in, in talking about the afterlife is, is very, very similar. In uh, he uh, Hell, uh, in uh, uh, Lewis's uh, The Great Divorce, he has a, uh, he imagines what hell might be like, which uh, a place of, of in increasing lo uh, separation from God and therefore increasing uh, loneliness, aloneness. You're alone with, your, with yourself uh, in the end. Now, MacDonald, in one of his great unspoken sermons, the last farthing, he imagined something very similar, right? You, you, you get to be, uh, you've rejected God and you're alone with yourself, but, but that's where the two part company, because McDonald said, well, wait a minute. If, if, as, as the apostle Paul said, if, um, you know, if in God we live and breathe and have our being, then separation from God is going to be when when all the illusions are stripped away, it's going to be agony, uh, and um, no one in his right mind would choose agony. You know, if you're insane, uh, well, that can be cured. God can cure insanity, right? Um, we even have, you know, that's a, a you have the insanity defense in, in in our trials, right? So, in the last farthing, uh, that state of aloneness is what gradually leads every last soul realizing that they're only their only joy, their only hope for 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 happiness, uh, let alone bliss, is to find their way to the loving heart of the Father. So uh, uh, it's, it's sort of ironic that uh, uh, Lewis uh, used McDonald as a character in the Great Divorce. He has McDonald as his guide to to sort of the the gateway to heaven, but. Uh, this was his chance to sort of correct the one mistake that his master had. And so he, he puts words in McDonald's mouth uh, where clearly McDonald has repented of this <laughs> belief in, in universal salvation. And I kind of imagine in November of 1964, when Lewis passed on to, you know, the great, across the, the great divide, and I can kind of imagine uh, McDonald meeting him. <laughs> and sort of 
you know, with his arms crossed and, and sort of tapping his foot and saying, we, we, we got to talk, Lewis, about uh, what you were, what those words you put in my mouth. But whatever. I'm sure they've made up by now uh, over many, uh, many beers in the third heaven. So anyway, that's uh, that's uh, McDonald and Lewis. Uh, but McDonald in particular, I, I really think uh, bringing me to uh, to Christ, for which I owe him an infinite debt. So you obviously were quite touched and impressed by the writings of McDonald and Lewis. I know that you have spent a lot of your life since then putting quite a bit of enthusiasm into promoting McDonald. Do you want to talk to us about that? What, what, what made you decide to, to put so much effort into promoting McDonald and maybe even give a quick description of what sorts of things you have done, which are many I know. Sure, sure. As I said, obviously, I, I, I felt a great uh, debt to the man. And, you know, Lewis is is uh, very, very famous. And uh, he gets a pass, in fact, even from from those who whose theology is quite different. I mean, he, he's revered or, or, you know, highly respected, at least, by, um, I think, across all denominations, uh, including the, the Reformed uh, Church. McDonald, on the other hand, is is much less well known, and so that struck me um, uh, as unfortunate. And the one of McDonald's greatest works, uh, Unspoken Sermons, um, uh, Terry had encouraged me to read it, uh, but I didn't. I didn't get finally get to read it until after she had passed away, and so that maybe made made my reading of it all the more uh, poignant. And found that you know the the it it is the the ultimate uh, statement of uh, McDonald's uh, theology, if we can call it that. Um, and uh, but it it struck me that the unspoken sermons could be intimidating to a lot of people, right? That uh, it's it's a uh, three volumes um, of uh, his Victorian prose, and uh, I, I decided one of the first projects I took on was I said, you know, let me, I want to create a, a daily devotional where I, I don't change McDonald's language. You know, the, the, it is what it is, but I shorten, you know, he, like many Victorian writers, uh, why say, uh, why you say something in 10 words, if you can say it in 20 or 30 words. Right. And so I thought, you know, his, I can capture his meaning um, in a lot less words simply by creating a Reader's Digest version, essentially. Uh, so a daily devotional where you could read it through and as though you were reading unspoken sermons, but it's about half the word count. So 365 uh, uh, entries. And I, uh, I actually uh, I could have copied and pasted from the Internet. All of his works are available on the Internet. Uh, but I. I typed it um, by hand, um, uh, just as almost a, like a devotional meditation uh, uh, exercise, um, uh, typing it up and published uh, that as Consuming Fire, the daily devotional version of Unspoken Sermons in, in, in uh, 2015. And then um, that led me, uh, that was immediately pretty pretty successful. Now, what that led me, though, is to think, you know, I... I want to take another a bigger bolder step in trying to help popularize uh, McDonald um, and I, and that's where I created um, the works of George McDonald website works of um, which was uh, not only to provide information about McDonald and his works uh, but also uh, for the um, as a vehicle almost an open platform for the George McDonald community, uh, where we would uh, showcase works that were inspired by George McDonald, could be writing, could be paintings, but um, probably most frequently music. Uh, and that's been that's been a wonderful thing. Um, a lot of musical, uh, we feature a lot of musical settings of McDonald, uh, particularly uh, the, um, the his writings that have most inspired music, not surprisingly, have been fantasies and fairy tales. Um, his the, the two uh, great novels that bookend his career, his his sort of fantasy novels, uh, Fantasties and Lilith, 
Um, and but then also uh, the princess and the and the and the goblin. Um, uh, you know, the light princess and the day boy and the night girl have been, there have been musicals that have been made of those, right? Um, and we featured uh, some things from uh, from those musicals on the uh, on the website. But also information about uh, those who have inspired McDonald and who he has in turn inspired, you know, all the way to the, to the present day. And uh, also uh, the website has been involved in creation of new editions of George McDonald's works, uh, particularly where we could add value uh, in in some way. Um, so one of the first things we started doing in partnership with David Jack is editions uh, of the so-called Scottish novels, the ones that uh, have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the dialogue is in the Scots language. Uh, that can be a a, a bit tough uh, for uh, for people, and so. Uh, these uh, featured uh, are we, we have uh, created editions that featured both the um, the original uh, Scots and side by side with an English translation. And then David Jack has taken that ball and is running with it uh, himself, publishing uh, those Scots, what we call Scots English editions. Uh, a lot of what I've been doing since then uh, have been um, uh, editions that feature you know, very extensive introductions and prefaces that add a lot of insight into his work. So, for example, uh, we are coming out uh, in the next, probably oh, by early next week, uh, with a new bicentennial uh, edition of, of uh, Hope of the Gospel and Miracles of Our Lord. And that features, uh, for example, uh, an introductory uh a set of reflections on McDonald by Perry Zahn. That's uh, Brian Zahn's uh, wife and co-pastor at uh, Word of Life uh, Church. And prefaces, a uh, preface for Hope of the Gospel by uh, one of your previous guests, um, uh, Kirsten Jeffrey Johnson, and a, uh, a preface for uh, Miracles of Our Lord uh, by theologian uh, uh, Julie Canlis. She'd be a great guest, uh, guest for you. And uh, most substantial, a 17-page introduction by the world's greatest McDonald expert, Barbara Amell, uh, with all kinds of incredible insights uh, uh, and perspective on uh, both help of the gospel and miracles of our Lord that I think people are going to be just fascinated by. So that is, uh, and, and the cover image Christopher McDonald, great great grandson of, of George, uh, gave me permission to use a, a picture that hasn't gotten. You know, we all see the same pictures of, of George McDonald over and over again, but this was one that that hasn't gotten a lot of play. And we created a colorized version of it with his shockingly blue blue eyes, um, and uh, so it's a pretty cool cover. And uh, the book should be coming out next week. And I'm excited about that. That's just an example of, you know, we have editions of Unspoken Sermons and mm -hmm. Lilith, uh, an illustrated edition uh, by an Italian fantasy artist that's, uh, you know, so new editions that that add value in some significant way. And that's been a lot of fun. Um, and, for, you know, how can you how can you possibly repay a debt like uh, like someone bringing you uh, from uh, from unbelief to uh, into the the arms of Christ. That's uh, it's, it's a, just a joy. I'll, I'll say that your work on those items have changed my life, at least in the sense, in, in multiple ways it's benefited me, but in the grand sense that it got me out of doing something. And what I mean by that <laughs> is I, I discovered McDonald and started reading him uh, approximately the same time frame as you, around 2005. And I became compelled by him right away, and I started searching around the internet for information about McDonald, or are there any communities, or anything about McDonald, and I found very little. And I felt this urge or compelled within inside me to somehow promote McDonald, and more people ought to know about him, and so forth. So a lot the same sort of feeling that I heard you describing. And I remember weighing that feeling within me of, boy, I feel like I'm responsible to do something. And I, I held that for some years, and then and then I came back to it and said, maybe I should do something. And I did one more search on the internet, and then I found your website and various other things. And also, around that same timing, of course, a number of other people have picked up promoting uh, McDonald as well with um, in all kinds of ways, like graphic novels and all sorts of new interest in McDonald. But 
at any rate, your work saved me some work. That's that's <laughs> my point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been gratifying. We 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 get uh, uh, we get over forty thousand uh, unique visitors uh, a year, uh, and what particularly fascinates me is that when um, when I run the geography on that, it's from you know, over a hundred different countries. Uh, uh, some some of which I've never even heard of um, all over the world. So uh, that's kind of cool. Excellent. There's been some amazing art through there as well. Um, the Lilith edition you mentioned is stunning. Uh, so I love to see all the art begetting art where the inspiration from George creates new things. Um, so there's some beautiful oh, stuff. Yeah. And, and, and that one also has a, a great, very extensive introduction by Kirsten Jeffrey Johnson, um, which was, I, I think, very helpful because Lilith is one of those works that uh, can baffle some people. And um, maybe it's one of those things that some people will start and then put down and then years later, they'll pick it back up and say, oh, well, wow, this is this is incredible. But uh, her, her intro, I think, is a great help. I've had a, a fair amount of success, actually, with Lilith with non-Christians. Um as approachable and, and readable to them. And and George in general tends to be more acceptable, but um, Lilith in particular seems to be a good entryway for non-Christians. Um, it seems to be a tougher read. Yeah, I would I, I can see that because because um, you don't really get into the theological, if I remember correctly, uh, it, it's really the, the conclusion of the novel, by which point anybody is if they've gotten or that far into it they're already hooked right they're not going to all of a sudden you know in the last 20 or 30 pages of a, a lengthy novel um you know throw it across the room because uh because it talks about god and gets into some into some theology um but it's also a a, the, a theology that, that would uh you know perhaps shock the typical non-believer who is used to like i was thinking of the God that gets, you know, the God who, uh, who says, Hey, you know, believe or, or suffer the eternal consequences. The combat boot in the sky. Very different. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the translations yeah. have been helpful too in the um, way back in the day before there was anything, I would scour the world for these books and find them. Um, and I had a friend who actually picked one of the Scottish novels up and opened it to a really Doric section and was like, you read this? Um, which makes it hard to loan to people because they're immediately daunted. Um, so having translations and having the sermons with, as Michael Phillips put it, more white space. So there's, there's a translation going on there as well, which doesn't take away from his words, but allows uh, folks to grasp it easier. Um, and all those are entry points because I find amongst a lot of readers, they start with whatever's easier and then segue towards uh, the original materials and the, and the harder stuff. So I think you're doing a great service there. But um, there's currently the uh, uh, music thing going on there, is that going to eventually be offered as a playlist or an album or something? Or is that uh, staying on the site? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, no, just, just, we're just gonna, you know, feature music on the side. But you know, it's a good point that uh, we probably should. I mean, the site, I have to, to say, it's a, it's a, uh, perhaps not the best organized uh, website uh, known to man. Uh, it's a little bit probably like going to visit your an eccentric uncle who, you know, lives in a in a strange Victorian mansion where. Where, which has all kinds of fascinating things in it, but you never know where where you're going to find them. And if you just have to sort of search and open up a door as you go down some strange passageway and you say, "Oh my goodness, look at look what's in here!" So uh, the website is a little bit like that, um, uh, for better or worse. And but we probably should put all. Uh, while the, the music is on, we have a, a one of our regular blogs is uh, is called uh, Pictures, Poems, and Song. Uh, and that's where we tend to feature the uh, uh, the music. Uh, but I should probably just put all of the music in one very convenient spot and and highlight it on the on the homepage. As I'm thinking about this, uh, Dan's okay, suggestion of putting it putting it out as an album would be pretty interesting, given that there's such a wide variety of genres of the music. 
Yeah, the, yeah. The people put <laughs> out know. albums anymore, though, or everything is like well, you know, a playlist like, anyway. Go to yeah. YouTube, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> When uh, I went to one of the conferences and they had the uh, George McDonald or C.S. Lewis and George McDonald in Indiana, um, they had a playlist for the event, um, which was a huge range of different musical styles and types and things, but all relating. Um, so I didn't find it jarring in that instance because they did a pretty good job in arranging it as it flowed from one style to another. Mm-hmm. But, but a playlist, uh, is is a reasonable idea um there's also on yeah, the yeah there's also on the website um links to a variety of uh, media so some of the plays some of the audiobooks some of the different things that have come about so it's a good clearing house for finding if you're interested in what has been done for film what has been done for plays or whatever that um all of that is on there as well mm-hmm. what do you have planned for the future well, we're um, as, as I think uh, one of you might have alluded to. Our, we're actually at, at, uh, in the process of sort of encouraging uh, more uh, more music um, in time for the bi- uh, bicentennial uh, celebration. George's two hundredth birthday uh, is next year, right? Actually, next December tenth. But um, yeah, it'll only be one hundred and ninety nine in. Uh, three days, right? Um, the uh, big bash, uh, at least um, in in the colonies here on, in the United States, is uh, going to be in uh, at Wheaton College in uh, late May. Uh, we have uh, links to that on uh, the homepage of, of the website, or you go to the George McDonald Society uh, to register uh, for that. Uh, at, uh, but we're hoping to have a lot of music uh, at the big uh, the big birthday batch bash. I was hearing from um, I think from Kirsten that Andrew Peterson uh, might uh, be attending. Um, and boy, it would be uh, he, he's he, he's one of my fa- you know favorite musicians, and uh, that would be thrilling if he would uh, if if he would perhaps compose, put some of McDonald's words to music for the occasion, but we'll have to see what happens. And for those of you who may not be aware, Jess also plays a main piano. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, in fact, I was inspired when, um, uh, in, in two, my son was born in, um, 2015, just, uh, one month before, uh, Mac- McDonald, November, November t- uh, 10th. Um, and, uh, that had inspired me to, uh, compose. That was a, the last, probably the last music that I, or one of the best things I composed anyway, was, uh, a piece that, uh, uh Barbara Amell and, uh, a very talented, uh, Drew Rutledge, a very talented, uh, soprano, um, uh, Portland based soprano, uh, created a video for, which from his poem, uh, Baby. Where did you come from, baby dear? Uh, and that was a, yeah, that meant a lot to me. So that was that was my effort to put uh, McDonald uh, to music. That poem shows up in so many places. I find I've seen it on samplers, and, you know, antique paintings. Stephen oh. King, Stephen King quoted it uh, without source um, in an introduction to one of his books about you know my. The ladies in my family, when I was a kid, used to recite this poem. That one has traveled a lot, not always with George's name, but uh, so that was a good. Wow, Stephen King, that's an interesting uh, person to uh, to be quoting baby. Uh-huh. So you, you referred to uh, some, plenty of McDonald's works already. What are what are some of your favorite works? Well, it, it's it's hard to pick a very favorite, but uh, but certainly um, uh, one of uh, one of the, of the novels that I love the most uh, is um, uh, "What's Mine's Mine," and if you guys are, are up for it, there's a passage uh, which I think uh, captures um, uh, McDonald's uh, writing skill. Uh, you know, Lewis tended to deprecate the uh, McDonald uh, pure writing skills, but but uh, uh, this is one of the, of his novels where where his writing is at the is at the strongest. 
um, but and also his uh, his theological uh, uh, insights. So if if you're up for it, I could read oh. you the a passage. Sure, that would be great. We right. always love to hear things that yeah. our guests like to share. So one of lovely. one of the uh, the major characters in in this. Uh, book is uh, Ian, and in this passage, he's talking to his mother. He's probably uh, in his 30s, um, let's say late 20s or somewhere in his 30s, and he's he's talking about a, a an incredible experience he had in in Russia when he was in. These, these are uh, men that are, the book is set in the Scottish Highlands, uh, but when he was in Russia in the in the far, dark forests of Russia and in a tree surrounded by wolves. So this is toward the end, and he says, uh, uh, he's describing, I fired and fired, and still they kept rushing on the tree, heaping themselves against it. Those behind struggling, struggling up on the backs of those next to it in a storm of rage and hunger and jealousy. Not a few who had just helped to eat some of their fellows were themselves eaten in turn, and not a scrap of them left. But it was a large pack, and it would have taken a long time to kill enough to satisfy those that remained. I killed and killed until my ammunition was gone, and then there was nothing for it but await the light. And then a bit later on, he says, uh, All at once came a great stillness, as of a desert place, where breathed nor life of man nor life of beast. I was alone, frightfully alone alone as I had never been before. The creatures at the foot of the tree were still howling, but their cry sounded far away and small. They were in some story I had been reading, not anywhere in my life. I was left and lost. Left by whom? Lost by whom? In the waste of my own being, without stay or comfort. I looked up to the sky. It was infinite yet only a part of myself, and much too near to afford me any refuge from the desert of my lost self. It came down nearer. The limitless space came down and clasped me and held me. It came close to me, as if I had been a shape off which all nature was taking a mold. I was at once everything and nothing. I cannot tell you how frightful it was. In agony, I cried to God with a cry of utter despair. I cannot say whether I may believe that he answered me. I know this, that a great quiet fell upon me, but a quiet as of utter defeat and helplessness. Then again, I cannot tell how, the quiet and helplessness melted away into a sense of God, a feeling as if great space all about me was God and not emptiness. Wolf nor sin could touch me. I was a wide peace my very being peace, and in my mind, whether an echo from the Bible, I do not know, were the words, I, even I, am he that comforteth thee. I am God, thy Savior. Whereas I had seemed all alone, I was with God, the only withness man can really share. I lifted my eyes. Morning was in the east, and the wolves were slinking away over the snow. How to receive this strange experience the mother did not know. She ought to say something, for she sorely questioned it. Not a word had he spoken belonging to the religion in which she had brought him up, except two, sin and God. There was nothing in it about the atonement. She did not see that it was a dream, say rather a vision of the atonement itself. She did not understand that salvation lies in being one with Christ even as the branch is one with the vine, that any salvation short of God is no salvation at all. What moment a man feels that he belongs to God utterly, the atonement is there. The Son of God is reaping his harvest. Beautiful. Completely biased towards that book. I think it is one of his top couple. Yeah. yeah. It's, in, it's in my top five favorites also. And, and, I could not say which is the top of the top five. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, the, the, the beautiful thing is that, you know, it's one thing to, um, to read. McDonald lays out uh, much, much the same point in, say, unspoken sermons, for, uh, for example. Uh, but uh, what's so, uh, you know, the power of, 
of conveying that message with a dramatic scene like this, where you can feel yourself um, in Ian uh, and identify with him and go from this pure terror and pure aloneness to it, you know, to and that the sense of sort of giving up. He can't. There's nothing more he can do. He's in despair. He's helpless. And then he he feels God, a God with him. And it's uh, it's that at that oneness with God, at one meant right atonement. Um, that is uh, uh, the atonement that that McDonald believed in with all his heart and soul and mind. The last bit you said there made me think of a quote from What's Mine is Mine. The quote is, All that is not rooted in him, Ian would say, all hope or joy that does not turn its face upward is an idolatry. Our prayers must rise that our thoughts may follow them. Any quote you want to share, Dan? That man has begun to be strong, who has begun to know that separated from life essential, that is God, he is weakness itself, but of strength inexhaustible, is if he be one with his origin. That's certainly what George is always trying to point us toward, is that message right there. Absolutely. Great. Well, it's good to, good to get to know you a bit more, Jess. I know you and I have interacted a number of times over the last several years, but only mildly i've never really gotten to get to know you so appreciate the yeah, opportunity yeah i appreciate it we want to thank everyone for joining us for this installment of making friends with george mcdonald please join us next time where we'll discuss all things gm talk to you then bye